So again, this has been a really short series and a short book. Uh, Greg spoke last week about chapter 2, and then uh, the week before that, I spoke in the first chapter. It's centering around this idea of why does God allow evil in this world? If God really is who he says he is, if he really is powerful, if he really is all-powerful, if he really is loving, why does he allow so much evil in the world? And I've said, like, if, if, you, um, if you speak to anybody on the street, or maybe if you own, search the own recesses of your heart, or your mind, or your doubts, your questions, that's probably the question you will have wrestled with as well. And the very fact that there is an entire book, and not just one, but actually several books of the Bible, that address this very issue, that is good news for us, as people who want to learn what it means to follow Jesus. Because it means that following Jesus does not involve putting our head in the sand, or pretending like everything is okay, when in reality it's not. But rather, it allows us, it gives us the freedom to engage and wrestle with this question with a great sense of honesty and almost like an integrity of our, personal, our personality. Because we know our God is big enough to handle our questions, and our God is also able to enter into our experience with us through the power of his spirit to comfort us, and to encourage us, and actually allow us to, as the Bible calls it, to lament, where we are able to bring our questions, we are able to bring our hurts to God in prayer. Uh, Even if it's not a a spoken prayer, if it's just an emotional, deep groaning in our heart, God brings us into his presence to do that. Lamenting is not simply listing all the things that annoy me or all the things that I'm unhappy about, but rather it's a deep-seated heart emotion that allows you to bring your uh, tear-stained prayers to God, saying, how long, O Lord? And all throughout these questions that Habakkuk has been asking, there have been several anchor points in this book, like where it just kind of seems like he's, he's running or he's getting tossed around by the waves of doubt or the waves of uncertainty or questions and, and almost like a, a maddening sense of, God, why do you allow this? And then there's a couple anchor points where it just kind of stops his questions and reminds him of what is true. One of them is a, 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 a parallelism, which is a common um, tool in Hebrew poetry where he compares one thing to another. In this case, it's kind of like an opposite parallel or an antithetical parallel. He says, the wicked are puffed up, but the righteous live by faith. And when I hear that, puffed up, um, I think of like when I'm at the gym and I see people who are flex- like literally flexing in front of the mirror and holding their phone out like this because they're taking a picture of themselves, that's the demonstration of where they're puffing themselves up to look good for their Instagram followers or whoever. They are puffed up, and I would put myself in that category because there are times when I do it too. It's, a, it's, this, it's this expression to where you're like, you see yourself and you're kind of like, man, I'm really good at being me. And in this case, the nation of Babylon is the nation that is puffed up. They are drunk on their own power. They catch a, a glimpse of themselves in the mirror, and they're kind of like this. You know, if they had a phone, they would take a picture of themselves. Actually, what they do in many cases, they would write about their accomplishments, and they would send it all over the world to wherever it was that they conquered and say, we the Babylonians, um, you know, to, to, to summarize, we're the best. Don't even try and mess with us. We will destroy you if you do. And so Habakkuk says, the wicked are puffed up. They rely on themselves. But the righteous are the ones who trust God's promises. They are the ones who trust that God is able to do what he said he is able to do. And that's actually repeating a theme that you see a lot in the Psalms. Like when you think about Psalm number one, it says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He does not sit in the seat of scoffers or stand in the way of mockers. But rather, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And then the opposite is, not so the wicked. It says the the righteous man will endure, but the wicked will perish. And so again, our anchor is that the wicked may puff themselves up, but God will bring them down, and the righteous will live by God's promises. 
And then that picks up later in the Gospels to see how Jesus is the fulfillment of that, that the righteous person, the one who is able to stand in a right relationship with God, is the one who trusts that Jesus is enough for them. That they don't need to stand on their own accomplishments, but rather they are able to, like Habakkuk, trust that God is able to provide. And God provides immeasurably more than we can even think possible for us in Jesus. So anchor number one is that the righteous live by faith, but the wicked puff themselves up. And a second anchor that I found um, in, in Habakkuk is when he's getting tossed around by the questions, by the sea of uncertainty, he says, but the Lord is in his temple. And that is actually at the end of chapter two. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all of the earth be silent before him. And here, again, he's repeating a theme that you see in the book of Psalms, this, especially in, the, in Psalm 73, where the psalmist is like, God, why do you allow the wicked to, to prosper? Why is it that the bad guy seems to be winning and the good guy is losing? It seems like being faithful to God is useless because all it does is get me into trouble. But the people who throw God's law aside, they're the ones who are prospering militarily, financially, uh, economically, all of, all of that. And right in the middle of that passage, or right as the theme in Psalm 73 switches, it says, but then I saw, or I was reminded, that the Lord is holy in his temple. So Habakkuk's assurance, much like the book of Psalms, much like all throughout the rest of scripture, is that when we are feeling like the waves of doubt and uncertainty and questions about why evil is allowed to exist, we are reminded God is in his temple. God is still in control. But then that, of course, raises questions. Well, if God is still in control, why doesn't he do anything about it? Why does he allow that to happen? And all throughout Habakkuk, he brings his complaints before God. He says, but I will wait. I will listen. I will basically stand on the walls of the city where, like, you know, the, the guards were posted looking for you know, enemies coming to us. I will stand on the walls and I will wait for God's response. And so chapter two is basically God saying, I'm going to bring the Babylonians in to judge my people. But I'm not going to let them get away with it. I will bring in the wicked nation of Babylon, but Babylon will become so drunk on their own power that the very thing that Babylon will use to uh, take over the world, whether it's military strength or economic policy, all of those things that they relied on for their strength, God is actually going to use them to destroy themselves. God basically lets them get so drunk on their own power that they fall apart. And so chapter 2 includes a series of woes about woe to the person who exploits the poor, woe to the person who relies on violence, woe to the person who builds their nation on the backs of slaves. And so as he is saying that the nation of Babylon is trying to fill the earth with its name, but God is going to bring them down. And then he says in chapter 2, and in chapter 2, verse 14, he says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of of the glory of the Lord. Babylon has been trying to build a name for themselves, but they will fail, and God's glory will fill the earth. So two is all about how God is going to bring down Babylon. And then three, chapter three begins. Habakkuk responds to this in prayer. Oftentimes in the scriptures, when they see God act, whether it's something that they hear about what God is going to do, or whether they actually see how God has demonstrated his power over something, the natural response of people is to pray. And more often than not, in their their prayers, it includes praises, like uh, demonstrations of their faith that God is able to do these things. It's a, an amazing thing to think that how oftentimes we neglect what prayer is, that it's simply a list of things that we want God to help us out with, rather than a response of us witnessing how God has saved us in the past, as well as trust in him to provide for us in the future. And so Habakkuk basically says, God, I've heard what you have done. And maybe he's thinking about uh, 
past instances, like in the book of Exodus, about how God rescued his people from slavery, or maybe he's responding to what God has told them that he's going to do just in the chapter previous. But he says, God, I have heard of your fame, and I stand in awe of your deeds. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. So basically, he's saying, God, I trust that what you have done in the past, I, I believe what you have done in the past, I've heard about it, do it again. We've been singing that song recently, do it again. And here's Habakkuk is saying the same thing. God, what you have done in the past, do it again. You are able to do it. And then he goes on to say that, but in your wrath, remember mercy. So God is saying, I'm going to bring, a, bring like this cataclysmic event on the nation of Judah because of their sin. I'm going to bring in the Babylonians. And the whole world is going to get tilted upside down for you. And Habakkuk says, basically, I'm waiting for this day. But God, in this time of your wrath, in this time of uncertainty, in this time of instability, we need you to show us mercy. Where there is uncertainty, May you be our certainty. Where there is instability, God, be our rock. Because he says, if if you don't do it, God, we're not going to last. It's a common theme throughout the scriptures. God, if it were not for your mercy, if the Lord had not been on our side, then our enemies would have surely overtaken us. And maybe you can think about a time in your own life where you can look back and say, I didn't see it then, but as time has gone on and as I'm able to reflect on it, I am able to see how God has provided for me. That if he didn't do it, there would have been no hope. So chapter 3, verse 3 starts a poem where Habakkuk sees God coming. This time it's not a demonstration of what God is going to do through other nations, through the nation of Babylon, but rather this is a time when God himself shows up to rescue his people. How he's going to rescue his people from Babylon, but it doesn't just stop with Babylon. God also sort of casts the net of his redemption, not only against their immediate enemy, but also against a greater enemy. Just, it seems like he, God has this plan not only to, to, to take care of the nation of Babylon, but, but all nations that set themselves up opposed to God, that set themselves up against God's people. God says, I'm going to do something about it. And God's plan to do something about it is for himself to show up. And so this section continues, and he uses some awesome imagery poetry, as well as referring to a collective cultural identity about the way that God has moved to talk about how God is going to show up. So in that second section, it says that God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praises filled the earth. Those two regions that he's talking about are actually referring to the, the, the road that the nation of Israel took from Exodus. That when, uh, when they left Egypt through the desert, through the wilderness, and into the promised land, Habakkuk is sort of having this vision about how God is repeating that direction. He's coming. It's like he's standing on the walls, and he see, sees God coming up over the horizon. And then he goes on to say that as God gets closer, his glory fills up everything, like God's bigness, God's presence. Like if you've ever been in the room with somebody who just kind of seems to command the room, you know, whenever they're there, it's like their personality. It's sort of like when they're in the room, everybody pays attention to them. And in some way, that's sort of a way to understand glory, Uh, just their, their presence, the effect of their presence. Now multiply that by 100 billion, and then you're starting to understand what God's glory is like. So when God shows up, his glory, his presence fills the earth with light. And other passages of the scriptures, in Psalm 19, it talks about how the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth declares his wonders. So when you go outside and you look at the creation, when you look at the stars and you're like, like, wow, God is so powerful. Look at how his creation shows who he is. That's not what's happening in this chapter. Rather, what he's talking about is how God's glory fills up the earth. God himself, his splendor, fills up the earth with light. 
His glory covers the heavens, it says. His splendor is like the sunrise overtaking the darkness of the morning. And he's repeating that idea from chapter 2 about how the knowledge of the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And as God gets closer, in verses 5 through 10, if you're able to read that either on the screen or in the Bibles in front of you, as he gets closer, as God comes closer, the physical creation can't handle God's presence. Habakkuk starts writing that when God shows up, plagues and went before him, pestilence follows his steps. He's repeating Exodus themes about how God is using plagues to cast down nations that set themselves up against God and his people. And when God stood, he shook the earth. He looked and he made the nations tremble. It's like that feeling you get when you're a kid and you're talking and your mom or your dad looks at you and you know you're in trouble. And the worst part is it's like they don't have to like scowl at you, but it's almost that look that they give you where it's like their face remains exactly the same, but you know that you are in trouble. In some way, that's sort of what this is like. God looks at the direction of the nations and they know that's it for them. Maybe I'm the only person who's experienced that look. But nonetheless, God, when he shows up, it says, even the mountains start crumbling. The earth starts shaking. I mean, when you think about mountains, they are the picture of safety and security. If you're being attacked, you want to put yourself up on a high spot in a mountain because the mountain is your place of security. Nonetheless, when God shows up, the mountains fall apart. And when he's using that language about how the earth is shaking and mountains are quaking, people who knew the story of God from the scriptures would have remembered him. Oh man, I remember when God rescued his people from slavery and he brought them to Mount Sinai and he gave them the law. When God showed up, the mountains quaked and the earth seemed to fall apart in God's presence. And so he's using imagery from the book of Exodus to show that God is going to do it again. He reminds his people of the way that he has saved them in the past as a way of showing them and assuring them, I will save you again because you are my people. You are my covenant people. In verses 8 and 10, it has this weird sort of digression where it starts to talk about, like, were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea? And we're kind of like, what's that talking about? Does God hate water? Why, why, why does it sort of take this side road where all of a sudden God seems mad at the water? And if you've ever read scriptures, a lot of times you'll see water imagery. And you'll think to yourself, well, why does God use water imagery? Why does God use like, this idea of like, the seas and the rivers and, and the oceans as sort of almost like a personification? Well, that's because in that culture, uncontrolled water was seen as a danger. I mean, obviously in this, this culture as well, we, we see, when we see the ocean riled up, we, we realize how small we are. But in those days, there was this, almost this, this sense of like chaos and evil associated with the water. And so oftentimes when you see in the scriptures God parting the sea or God calming the the sea or God parting a river to allow his people to walk through it, that's the Bible's demonstration that the scariest thing that you can think of, God has complete control over that. And he can do whatever he wants with it when he wants wants it. And actually, later on in in the book of Revelation, if you guys have read that book and you've been confused, which means you've been paying attention in that book, you start to see in chapter 13, it talks about how this beast comes out of the ocean. Again, it's repeating this idea that evil things come out of the ocean. But God still has control over it. So God is arriving. And as he's coming, his glory is filling the earth. The earth can't handle it. The scariest thing that they could think of, water, uncontrolled water, was no match for God. And finally, God arrives. In verse 11 through 15, it says, In wrath you strode through the earth, and your anger threshed 
threshed the nations. And we think about how in chapters 1 and 2, uh, Habakkuk is talking about how Babylon just seems to be able to sweep across the earth and everything is laid waste in front of it. But now God is saying, as scary as Babylon seems, they are nothing compared to me. This nation that seeks to set itself up, that boasts of its own ability, the, one, the, the nation that is puffed up in its own strength, God says, is no match for me. God strides forward in wrath. It says, in wrath you strode through the earth. And that idea of God's wrath makes some people uncomfortable. We don't like this idea of God having wrath because it conflicts with what our understanding that God is love. And we think to ourselves, well, we need to downplay God's wrath or we need to sort of minimize God's anger towards sin. But rather, when we try and downplay God's wrath, when we try and downplay God's righteous anger towards evil, sin, and injustice, we are actually doing God a disservice. We are making God less than he actually is. We, we see that as some, something to be embarrassed about, but rather God's anger towards sin, God's, God's promise to do something about evil is actually good news for us. That God cares and loves this world so much that he is actually going to do something about the evil that we see. And so this concept of God's wrath, God's anger, God's promise to do something about sin and evil is good news. It is good news. Verse 13, it says that you came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. Now in verse 13, this is almost one of those hinge verses as well that you want to pay attention to because when God comes out to save his people, in this people group, there's also this specified person this anointed one, which is actually a common theme that runs all throughout the scriptures as well, that as God is working and as God is saving and as God is ruling, he's actually doing it through somebody. God sets up this anointed person and actually in the Hebrew, there, there's a little bit of a wordplay that's going on where it creates this as an idea that not only is God saving his anointed one, he is actually saving with his anointed one. He's using this, this Davidic king, this, this king from the line of David as, as almost like a mediator or almost as like a, an instrument to rescue his people. It says, with your own spear, in verse 14, you pierced his head. When his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding, basically says, God, you used the instruments of the enemy against himself. It says, when you came, you rescued us, and you use the very weapons that the enemy used to defeat their leader. Again, it reminds us that in, in the Bible, God's way of, of judging nations oftentimes is allowing themselves to grow so big that the very thing that they become obsessed with ends up destroying them. And we actually see, we actually see this example of God's judgment against sin in everyday life when we start to think about addictions, things that you know, by themselves aren't necessarily bad, but they become so consuming that they take over our life to where we are no longer able to function without them. And so whether we, we think about you know, sort of the, the hard cases where we think about like drug and alcohol abuse to where like people become former shells of themselves and they destroy themselves, they de destroy their lives, or even this obsession that we have with technology to where it's like we have to have the latest sense of technology and it doesn't really matter what it does to us, but as long as we have our cell phones with us, we're okay and we don't need to engage in human react interactions with people. Or as long as we have the best job, we go to the best school, it doesn't matter how we got there. Eventually those things destroy us because those things become our gods. They leave us as former shells of ourselves. 
And so here, even the same, in the same way, the way that Babylon has relied on its military strength, God basically turns the table on them. Like somebody who studies judo, who is a third the size of the bully or the, the muscle-bound um, you know, aggressor in the bar, is able to use their own weight against them and take them down. So God uses what Babylon relied on to become their undoing. Which again is a sobering reminder for us about the intoxicating power that this world has on us. In our pursuit of power, our pursuit of acceptance, our pursuit of influence and money, how easily we become drunk on those things, not realizing how they are destroying us from the inside. And God continues this theme. He continues this theme about Babylon. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the last book that is written, Babylon comes back, which is interesting because Babylon was destroyed in like 539 BC, somewhere around there, and then never rises to power again. Yet nonetheless, in the book of Revelation, the last book that was written, hundreds of years after Babylon falls, Babylon comes back. And God has the same message of judgment in Revelation 18, where God is talking to his people and he's saying, you have to come out of Babylon. You have to escape. You have to flee because God is going to pay Babylon back for everything that it's done. If you're able to read that, it says, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven. God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay back to her double for what she has done. Pour a double portion of her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gives herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as a queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Death mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Later on in that chapter, it talks about how all of the nations, all the people who relied to Babylon, relied on Babylon, traded with her, saw Babylon as, her, as their identity. When they saw the destruction that happened, all they could do was weep. All they could do was mourn, because the once great Babylon was cast down. And so their source of identity, their source of security, their source of peace was gone. And this last section, Habakkuk responds to God's appearance. It, basically, he freaks out. My lips quivered, my bones decayed, my legs trembled. It's like when God showed up, Habakkuk couldn't handle it. Like in the book of Isaiah, when the glory of the Lord fills the temple and Isaiah is there, Isaiah says, I am undone. It's this picture like if you had a loose thread on a sweater and you just kept pulling it and the sweater unraveled. That's what Isaiah is like when he sees the glory of the Lord. He trust, Habakkuk trusted God. He loved God. He waited patiently for God. Yet nonetheless, when God showed up in all of his glory, he couldn't handle it. And I think that Habakkuk's response, in many cases, is sort of our own, that when we take a good long look in our hearts and we see where our mind goes, where our heart goes, where our attitude goes, where our attention and our money and our time goes, this idea that if God showed up without mercy, we would have no hope. If God were to keep a record of our sins, who could stand against it, it says in the book of Psalms? Habakkuk cannot stand in God's presence on his own. His body can't handle it. And yet it says, when he is confronted with this reality, he will wait patiently for the day of calamity. When God promises what is going to come, even though Habakkuk knows it's going to make life really, really terrible for him, as well as everybody else who lives in the land, if they're around when it happens, they know it is going to be this terrible, terrible day. Notice Habakkuk doesn't say, I dread the day, may it never come, get me a plane ticket so I can get out of here. Rather, he says, I will wait patiently 
for the day of calamity. I will wait patiently for God's judgment. In chapter 2, he says, I will wait patiently for God's answer. Now he's saying, I've received God's answer, and I will wait patiently for it. And this next passage is one of the most beautiful yet heartbreaking passages in the scriptures for those who trust God in their life. He says, in verse uh, 17, he says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of the deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. If you guys have ever seen mountain goats just walking up the side of a mountain like it's nothing. And in the same way, Habakkuk says, like, God is able to give me the strength and security that I am able to endure this. He goes on, he basically is saying in this passage that for followers of God, for people who trust in God's promises, though they are righteous... They will not escape the hardships of this world. He is saying that those who put their trust in God, centering their their life on the promises of God, does not exempt you from a life of pain. And if somebody has told you, whether you're a student here or as as a young adult, that when you trust in Jesus, everything in your life goes from good to great, when you will be victorious over every aspect of your life, when you will get that job, when you will get that health, when you will get that money, because Jesus is on your side. If somebody promises you an easy life in following Jesus, they are lying to you, either intentionally to lead you away, or they themselves have been deluded. And I think oftentimes in Christian media, it's portrayed that way as well, whether it's a movie or a song or a book we read, where if somebody has a difficulty in their life and they just sort of do a generic come to Jesus moment or trust God with something, all of a sudden all their problems go away. Rather, in the Habakkuk, he says, you are going to experience the fullness of what it is like to live in this broken world with famine, with economic hardship, with destitution, with violence. But he says... Yet in all of those things, I will rejoice in the Lord. How can Habakkuk say that? How can he say that he will rejoice in the Lord? Because he knows he can't rejoice in his circumstances. It's one of those things that maybe separates happiness from joy. Because how can Habakkuk rejoice in the Lord? Because he knows the God of the Bible. The one who is committed to defeat evil and the one who is committed and promises his presence to his people to continue to work in them and to save them. See, Habakkuk actually sees in some, in some way, some distant way in the future, how God's justice and God's love are working together in a perfect union to deal with evil, how God's love and his justice are working together to address this problem of evil in this world, how love and justice, while are not mutually exclusive, but are working together to save this world. And because he sees that, he sees that God is worthy of trust and his promises are worth centering and living his life around. And as Habakkuk is able to see that in this chapter, hundreds of years, Four, we see how Jesus is the full demonstration of God's commitment to defeat evil as well as God's commitment to his people. To defeat evil as well as to commit to his people. We see how Jesus is the full demonstration of God's both justice and love to deal with sin and death whether it's in the world around us or even in the sin of our own hearts, we see how Jesus is the full demonstration of that. As Habakkuk was talking about this time when the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul talks about how God has made the full demonstration of his glory in the face of Jesus. 
so that when you are looking at Jesus, when you see Jesus, you are seeing the full demonstration of God in the flesh. And in Habakkuk, when he's talking about how seeing God in his temple, in his dwelling place, was his assurance that God was still in control. So the book of John in chapter 1 talks about how Jesus came into this world and he made his dwelling amongst men. God came into this world and he dwelt amongst people. And in Acts chapter 2, we see how the apostles are talking about how God was able to use the evil desires of man, the evil, the evil uh, Roman crucifixion as the way to rescue and to forgive people of their sin. So Habakkuk is, is wondering how can God use the Babylonians to punish sin? So Jesus is the fulfillment of that because Jesus took on himself the injustice of the execution. And in in doing so, his blood is actually able to forgive our debts. As Habakkuk spoke about God rescuing his people and God rescuing his anointed one, so we see that God doesn't leave Jesus in the grave, but rather God rescues his anointed one by raising Jesus from the grave. And as it says in Romans chapter four, God raised Jesus from the dead for our justification. And so we see how Jesus is the fulfillment, the complete picture of God's commitment to destroy evil in this world, as well as rescuing his people, even as the last pages of the Bible finish. As Habakkuk was able to put his hope and his joy and his confidence in God, knowing that he will one day defeat evil, when we look in the book of Revelation, we see in chapter 19 about how Jesus is able to defeat the Babylon, the beast, the dragon, sin, and death. And as the book of Revelation closes in chapter 21, thinking about that time when Habakkuk says that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters covers the sea, so we see in Revelation chapter 1, 21, that when Jesus comes back, we see this picture about how God restores heaven and earth way, the way that it used to be. And it uses that picture about how God's glory would w- basically wipe away every tear from our eye. It would remove sorrow, it would remove sadness. And it says that God's glory so fills this picture, it uses the new Jerusalem as this, as this picture, that God's glory fills the new city and the presence of God is there and the presence of Jesus is there and their own presence is so light that there doesn't need to be any sun because God's presence is in communion, in community with his people and evil is no longer there. So here again, we see this picture about how God's plan to defeat evil centers around and finds its fulfillment in Jesus. How that gives us encouragement and hope when we face difficulties in our own life so that we know that God is still with us, that we are able to rejoice in the Lord, that even though, even though it may feel like there is nothing in this world that is going right, that this world may be falling apart, that maybe we feel like, as Habakkuk 3 said, that we're, 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 we may feel like you know, there, there's nothing on the trees, there's nothing in the fields, there's nothing in the stalls, there's nothing in our life going right. We are still able to see the resurrected Christ and say, because Jesus has been raised from the dead, I know that my God is still in control and he will save me. He will keep me. And so if you don't put your hope in Christ, what is there? If you don't rest your soul's peace, if you don't rest your heart, if you don't see the beauty of Jesus for you as your source of comfort and joy, what is there? Technology? Money? Fame? Friends? Strength? All that stuff will go away. You will pursue those things so much that you will waste away to nothing, you'll become a former shell of yourself, but Jesus invites us to come to him as we are so that we might have life and peace and hope. So my simple question for you today is, as you leave today, where is your hope? Where is your joy? Where is your confidence? 
Is it in the risen Christ? Let's pray.